My name is Rob Perks. I've been curator uh, for oral history at the British Library for 25 years, which is quite a long time really. And I think during that time I've seen some very significant shifts in oral history and the way that oral history has mm. been used. But the thing that's been a common thread throughout that is the way in which oral history is rescuing experience that's otherwise not documented and um, I've often thought particularly in the British context that that's perhaps less relevant in a society where technology is so much more accessible and people are recording mm -hmm. their own stories but actually it's become clear to me that throughout that period there are still whole sections of society which are undocumented disempowered and that oral history is a fantastic way of giving that voice um, and I guess it echoes back to the reason I got involved in oral history in the first place, mm. you know, coming out of a very traditional PhD and sort of discovering community history and discovering oral history in particular. And you know, where I was politically in, at that time in my life, I was really interested in, work, in working class history and um, the way in which oral history is a way of retrieving that history and actually empowering people within within society. So that's where I started and in, in a sense I still think that's relevant um, and the most recent work that I've been involved with for instance with uh, disabled people which are traditionally a huge gap in the British Library's collections. Um, it's interesting uh, when I did a survey of what existed in, in the Sound Archive collection related to disability virtually nothing. We look after the BBC Sound Archive virtually nothing. I mean it's just absolutely staggering that there's so little related to um, uh, disabled mm. people's experiences. So latterly I've been using oral history as a very mm. powerful tool to engage with disabled groups um, within British society and then use oral history as a tool for, for recording their experiences. Um, and that's raised all sorts of issues in terms of representation and involvement and are we the right people to be taking a lead. So we've developed the British Library a new mode of working with community groups is much more of a partnership role and I think that is very indicative of one of the other shifts that I've seen within oral history during that 25 year period which is a move from the sort of expert academic researcher oral historian to one of a much more involvement participatory model. Partly I think coming out of Mike Frisch's shared authority thinking about you know that, that it's not just it's not just take but actually it is a, um, a process of, of co-construction, to use Paul Telly's phrase, but also of sharing the authority over the creation of the material and what happens to it afterwards. So working with, uh, with disability groups is, is a, a brilliant reminder of the importance of participation and involvement and a brilliant reminder of the fact that the process is as important as the product that comes out of it. Because you know, I started life as an academic and in many ways I might still be thought of as an academic but I've always been very keen on you know, the, the power of oral history in terms of the process and mm. the benefit that people accrue from the process of being involved in talking, cross-generational transmission of information and, and understandings. Um, and that often, for many people involved in oral history, it's what it's the process of actually doing it that is as important as what comes out of it. Mm. So I'm constantly having to remind uh, people that I come in in contact with in academia that it's not just a question of you know acquisition of data to write books, but there is something else going on. And to be fair, I think academics themselves have shifted very significantly during that same period. Um, do you want to pause there, sir? Um, and your relationship, to, I mean, is, is there particular um, challenges with, I mean, there's struck, maybe there's a paradox or tension between the sort of empowerment, community orientation of the work that you do and being located within a, a national institution. Has that, that ever been a, a kind of issue of tension? Or was it easily assimilated within uh, sort of... Um, I mean, my, I started my oral history career in a, in a, mm. a community-based mm. context within a um, museum and library service mm. in the north part of England. So, so moving to 
the National Sound Archive, as it was then part of the British Library, was a, a move that sort of shifted me away from a local focus to a, to a national focus. Mm. Um, and there's disbenefits and benefits. The, the, the dangers is that you, be, you move more distant from, away from the community mm -hmm. and therefore the roots. The benefit is that you have access to more resources, that mm. you can do bigger projects and that you can operate on a, on a different level. And when I joined um, the British Library, National Life Story Collection, as it was it recently been set up by Paul Thompson, really as a, as a way of trying to do oral history with different echelons within society. Mm. So he had a number of ideas in terms mm. of a, what he called a national cross-section, which never really got off the ground initially. It got off the ground later through a different initiative called Millennium a Memory Bank, which was a joint initiative with the BBC that created mm. five and a half thousand interviews right across. So in a sense, we ended up achieving the national cross-section through a partnership with the BBC. But the other strand of Paul Thompson's thinking at that time was um, what a phrase he probably wouldn't certainly have used, elite oral history. In other words, he felt, and I still share that view actually, about what National Life Story Collection did in the early days, was that he was trying to use oral history as a methodology with areas of society which oral historians had not previously addressed. Mm. So, you know, the, the radical challenge of, uh, you know, documenting marginalised mm. groups, he, was, he would argue, and I would still argue, is in many ways as true of areas of society which are not normal, mm. um, comfortable ground for oral historians, which is, you know, working class, marginalised groups, gay and lesbian groups, ethnic groups and so on, all those groups where oral history remains a very strong and important tool. But um, in the early days of National Life Stories we did a number of projects, principally interviewing people in business and finance who who'd never been touched by oral historians before. Now some of those arguably were empowered, wealthy individuals with access to you know, uh, the reins of power and some of them wrote autobiographies and had access to, uh, to, mm. to archives and so on, but many of them didn't. Um, and, the, you know, I think, I, think I, I would still argue now that um, oral history um, needs to remain a broad uh, methodology to be used right across mm. um, society. So while, whilst it might work extremely well with certain groups, it can work with all groups within society. Now, when National Life Stories Collection started, that was quite radical talk. There was lots of, of criticism of National Life Story Collection, Paul in particular, uh, who, after all, the man you know who argued for a history from the bottom up, he seemed to be doing something that was rather different than yeah. what he seemed to espouse. But I actually, I think perhaps he was ahead of his time because you know, 25 years on, oral history pervades you know historic inquiry. There's very few areas of historical inquiry now which don't use or recognise interview methodology and oral testimony as a sort of core mm. a core resource and a, and a, a core source that that, um, that should be used. So maybe National Life Story Collection was ahead of its day. But when I took over from Paul, you know, I I was quite keen that it, that we didn't just do elites, that mm. we could actually use the power of a national organisation to actually do some UK-wide projects in areas that it meant that you could do a national survey. Mm -hmm. One of the frustrating things about working in a local archive, you're rather bound into that geographically local um, nexus, whereas if you're working in a national archive, you can do a much bigger survey and create a different corpus of material, which is perhaps of, of more use to academics in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, this might be a bit of a tricky question, but I mean, do you think you have less space to be critical? I mean, academics, for example, have, especially in a democracy, have the part of our role is to criticise the nation and the government for doing whatever. But um, I mean, are you limited by what you can do in terms of building an archive because you're not in academia, but you're actually just you kind of part of a public well, institution. I I mean, perhaps I didn't answer the, the last yeah, question accurately yeah. enough in terms of what it means to be within a national organisation. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if I was within the Imperial War Museum, then I might be in a more difficult position oh, okay. than within the British Library. The British Library is you know, a relatively liberal 
uh, it's open to different viewpoints uh, yeah. organization mm -hmm. and um, I've always had an independence of movement possibly mm -hmm. through National Life Story collection mm -hmm. so basically you know I've set my own collecting policy I know what's in the mm -hmm. collection we identify gaps in the collection mm -hmm. disability being one of them and then we set out to mm -hmm. to fill those the gaps in in the collections wherever wherever they might be and I don't think it is a any relevance at all that we're within the National Library. Mm -hmm. I can't see that I've never been confined mm -hmm. to by in any way um, you know I, I'm the curator I collect I set mm -hmm. the collective policy we decide what we want to do so you know we've done projects mm -hmm. on on HIV um, uh, we've done project on prostitution mm -hmm. uh, there's there's you know areas where some people would be reluctant to go but I think we're in a good position to to go into areas where other people would perhaps find it more difficult. Yeah. So, but I think having a round for a national archive, having a rounded approach to collecting is is really important. I think actually, and just being aware of a whole different number of constituencies that it's possible to engage with. One of the things I've learned of working with um, uh, disability groups is that it never occurred to many of them that they would have a place in the national library. Um, either they thought National Library wouldn't be particularly interested, or they didn't think they were important enough, or so. One of the one of the great things that I've learned about working with all sorts of groups, of which they would be an example, is that you can actually give currency and status and value to groups who feel that they don't they're not worth that status. Well, clearly they are, um, and just by bringing their collections into the National Library, you, you give them a, a, a status and an importance that um, is over and above the work itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very important. It's, it's important recognition mm -hmm. that you, you're giving people. Um, and I think that's very valuable, actually. Let's move on to your international work. How have you got as a, as a sound archivist and already starting drawn into the international projects I think we're, one of the one of the most exciting things about working at a national library is that you you have an international status just because you're working at a national mm -hmm. library mm -hmm. so fantastic thing about the last 20 odd years has been the ability to go to other countries learn about how they mm -hmm. deal history and so on but I've also done quite a lot of work of my own in um, mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet bloc, former Soviet bloc, and that that came out of um, work that I previously done in Bradford with um, Ukrainian migrants. So I've um, done quite a lot of work in Ukraine, uh, interviewing people. So the the work that um, um, I've done in the, uh, the former Soviet Union came out of some previous work I did when I was working in Bradford in the, the north of England where I became very interested in um, a group, a migrant group of Ukrainians. In fact, subsequently proved there were actually two separate groups of Ukrainians from different parts of Ukraine. So I became very interested in Ukrainian history and uh, uh, obviously you know, interviewing Ukrainians who settled in Bradford. Got, it was, I was intrigued to go back to Ukraine and, and all the places they talked about. Obviously, at that time, they were what were regarded as a captive nation. In other words, they couldn't return. Many of them had completely lost contact with um, any family that they had in the um, former um, Soviet Union. So, um, when communism began to um, shift and eventually collapse, there were a number of new groups emerging in, in Russia and Ukraine, particularly Memorial in Russia. and we made quite early contact with them and a group came over and we, we formed a bit of an exchange with a group from a workshop in Moscow who also had an outlet in um, what became St. Petersburg later um, and they were at a very early stage of sort of being sort of aware that oral history might be a tool that they could use partly to sort of rebuild society I suppose but also to, to redress the, the historical balance because a lot of, his, of historical archives had either been just thrown away or disbanded 
or distorted in, in various ways. So they recognised that there was this incredible um, fund of, of, of memories that people had, an experience that people had locked in their heads that was going to be the only way that they could actually tell the, the history of, uh, of, the, of the Stalin period in particular. Um, so, you know, in, the, in Ukraine's case, the Great Famine in 1932-33, um, the, the repressions and the, and the terror. So um, I went on a, on a trip to Moscow and then did uh, an amazing journey across the Soviet Union to, to Samarkand with this group of Russian oral historians um, who had organised a number of sort of summer trips um, during, in between their studies to different parts of the Soviet Union mm. to record different stories. And the story that we were recording in Samarkand was of... Um, uh, Crimean Tatars who'd actually been uh, moved overnight by train to uh, Uzbekistan, um, you know, just literally a whole people basically deported in an incredibly short length of time. Obviously a lot, a lot of people died and just exporting people to a different culture and a different time and just sort of letting them get on with it. So it was sort of emblematic really of um, of the Soviet Union and um, Stalin's policy of, of moving people around. Um, and then, having on the strength of that and having made some very good contacts, uh, I hatched a, a research project to actually go to Ukraine and try and get a sense of the, the homeland of, of the people that I've been interviewing in, in Bradford. And it, and it happened at a, a pretty critical time in, uh, in the collapse of communism. Um, so I was there the week after the storming of the White House. So it was, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in Russia and Ukraine because you really felt that oral history was absolutely at the centre mm -hmm. of change within society. You know, creating a new history, creating a new society um, and using oral history as the means of doing it. So, if, you know, coming from Britain where oral history was sort of on, originally at least, on the fringes of historical inquiry, seen as a sort of adjunct to documentary history. Here I was going into a society where it was completely turned on its head. You know, documentary history either wasn't there, um, or if it did exist, you know, it was heavily um, uh, hedged in by, you know, state control or, you know, fabrication in many cases. Um, and that was a very exciting time for me um, in a way th that I suppose I've since got a sense of of, of going to South Africa post-apartheid, post um, coming to Argentina where all history has been used as a, as a technique for, sort of, for recreating civil society after totalitarianism. But also some work I did in um, Romania. I went to Romania on a um, Council of Europe mission and met with uh, some oral historians there, um, post Ceausescu, who were using oral history as the basis for setting up a um, museum of totalitarian um, power in a place called Sigurd in the south of the, of, um, of uh, Romania. Sorry, north of Romania. Um, and that was, again, incredible to see the way in which oral history was sort of giving voice to people at a time when the society was beginning to, to open up um, and create new historical documents where none existed and creating a new society, new history. So for a short time I was involved in quite a lot that was going on and then I did a book and an exhibition based on the Ukrainian um, trip and um, began to think of what that meant for you know oral history um, in Britain, and of course it's quite difficult to to apply those sorts of lessons politically within Britain. Um, but I still think that the essential lesson of giving voice and empowering people with within any democracy or emerging democracy is critical, um, and we have to continue to do that within a, even a well-established democracy like Britain, where you know, within that 25 years that I've been working at the British Library, we've seen lots of, you know, shifting uh, political com complexions, um, and I, you know, I remain 
and remain clear that oral history is a tool for, for empowerment and for democratisation. Thank you very much.